Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum in Fairfield, Connecticut. I do know we have a, a very large and varied audience that is planning on joining us on the Quick Live this evening. So we would love for you to drop your location where you're watching from in the chat uh, so we can get a sense of uh, how broad our audience for Marcy Cooperman's talk may be. Our virtual lecture this evening uh, is being kindly supported by the Arts Institute of Fairfield University. And Marcy Cooperman can be found on Google if you just Google the terms color theory expert professor. And she told us this and I said, oh, I already knew that because that is exactly how our museum's director, Carrie Weber, had found her uh, about a year ago as we were looking for someone to give a talk through Fairfield University about color theory. So that was very funny. That's exactly exactly how we found her. And the reason we were looking for someone to speak about color theory in sort of any field is because we have an exhibition that will be opening in the museum's Bellarmine Hall galleries next week. Uh, the exhibition title is Suzanne Shamlin Studies in Color. Suzanne Shamlin is an associate professor of studio art at Fairfield University, and she has been exploring the Munsell color system since 2012 and sort of using that to study and learn about color relationships. So we thought we really need to get someone to speak about color theory. And so we were delighted to be able to connect with Marcy, who it turned out was fairly close to us geographically. Uh, Marcy Cooperman is a professor at the Parsons School of Fashion in New York City, where she teaches color theory, fashion marketing, visual merchandising, branding, social commerce, and entrepreneurship. She has also been a professor of color theory at Pratt Institute of Design, where she taught for many years in the Graduate Communications Design Department and the Industrial Design Department. Uh, Marcy is also the author of the 2014 Color, How to Use It, the first and only textbook for color theory, and which we, she was telling me about before we joined. It sounds like a fascinating book, so those of you who are interested can look that up on Amazon. Uh, Marcy Cooperman has a BS in fashion design from Drexel University, as well as an MBA from the Stern Business School at New York University, which allows her to approach her work from a business perspective as much as a design one. Among her business endeavors is Fresh Interiors, a bespoke interior design business, as well as a knitwear brand under her own name. And we are hoping that those of you who are in the New York City or Connecticut area will be able to uh, be inspired by what you hear tonight to come up and see Suzanne's show when it opens. It's her personal exploration of color theory. But for everyone watching, please feel free to put your questions to Marcy in the chat box as we go forward since I think she's gonna be sharing an extraordinary wealth of information crossing many fields. So don't feel that you have to hold your question till the end, put them in the chat box, and then I will rejoin Marcy on screen at the end of her talk to share with her some of your questions. So please join me in giving a big virtual welcome to Marcy Cooperman. Thank you, thank you. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I, I just wanna tell everybody that I'm, I, I feel like it's my major goal in life make sure that all artistic people, creative people, all designers know how to use color and color relationships together because it's a wonderful tool that you can learn and know how to use it in your work. So, um, so without further ado, let's get started. So this is what color and the visible spectrum actually is. You can see here a range of electromagnetic rays uh, starting from X-rays on the left to long radio waves in the middle. This is what comes from the light of the sun. And the only part of it that's actually visible is the color spectrum, the visible spectrum right in the very center in between ultraviolet and um, I don't know what IR is. So, um, but a very small part of it is visible. Everything else is not at all visible. And so that's what color is. And Isaac Newton, was the first person to realize that color comes from the light of the sun. Before that, a lot of people theorized what it might have been, and they, but they really didn't know. And he did this test, Newton, where you can, you can see a lovely painting of it there. He allowed a beam of sunlight to come from a chink in his shutters and pass through a prism. And it was refracted onto the wall, and he noticed that it came out in terms of what we call now the rainbow. It's the spectral colors. And it's the size and shape of the waves that make each color. So the red is always at one end. And it's uh, if you've ever heard of Roy G. Biz, 
it goes red, orange, yellow, green, that's G, blue, indigo, and violet at the other end. So this painting is kind of incorrect. It's got a pink on the end. There really isn't a pink for some reason on the spectrum. <clears throat> so he pulled all the colors, Newton actually pulled all the colors together in a circle. So we call it the color wheel. Uh, and it's really a wonderful way that you can use it to help you understand color relationships when it's in a circle like that, because we can see opposites this way and other uh, colors that have a relationship depending upon how far apart they are from each other. So we can see the lines I've drawn there are two different opposites, which are called complements, complementary hues. So you can see the red is opposite green, the purple is opposite yellow, and the orange is opposite blue. And a little bit later on, we'll be talking about color relationships. And the color wheel is really going to help us to understand how all of those hues are related to each other. If you put all of those colors, if you were using your paints and you mixed all those colors together using the primaries of red, yellow, and blue, you can get every single color in the world, everything, grays, browns, everything, uh, all different types of reds, blues, and yellows, and greens. But if you have the right proportions, you can make black. So that's why black is in the center. And on the outside, we have the red, the primaries red and yellow and blue. When you mix two primaries together, you get the secondary. So you have red and yellow giving you orange, red and blue giving you purple, and blue and yellow giving you green. So uh, a very important part about color theory is understanding how to describe color, how to understand what you're seeing and how to describe it using three words, three elements. So up here we have them, the three elements of color, and they are hue, value, and intensity. And so we're going to take a look at each of these elements, and I'll show you some images that I have found from the different fields of fashion design, interior design, and I have a little bit from graphic design as well. So we're gonna start with hue. To define hue, all we have to say is hue means the color name. So all those names that we know, red, yellow, blue, green, purple, black, white, even black, white, and gray, those are all color names and they're all hues. In color theory, we don't like to use lovely poetic words like burgundy or khaki or peach or any of the beautiful paint names that we see when we buy paint for our walls because they're not as specific and uh, Khaki, for example, my khaki might be different from your khaki. I might be thinking about kind of a green. And you might have in your head khaki pants that you bought from Gap, and maybe they're more of a gray or a beige. So in my color theory classes, I like to insist that my students just use the approved hue names that we know, red, yellow, green, blue. And let's go through it to see how we use that to describe color. So the primary hues, as I said, are red, yellow, and blue. You mix them together for secondary hues, and you get violet, orange, or you can call it purple, violet or purple, and orange and green. And in between those, we have what we call tertiary hues. And those are all spectral, and that means they come from the light of the sun. But there are some hues that are not spectral. They do not come from the light of the sun. And those are called achromatic, achromatic hues. That's black and gray and white. So gray comes from mixing white and black together. Those hues are called broken. That's because if we add gray or black or, or white to any of the spectral hues, then they are they're the lovely hues that we like to live with in our clothing and in our furniture, but they are no longer spectral hues. So we call them broken off the spectrum. So that's an example of uh, some colors, red and green, that are not exactly spectral hues, but they are not broken yet. We did not mix any kind of red, of uh, black and white or gray into it. But there are many ways that we can see red and yellow and blue and green that are spectral hues. So here's an example of using color, in this case, we have blue and orange together in this lovely painting from 1912. And uh, it makes an effect 
on each other. Those are compliments, and we're going to go more into color relationships a little bit later. Um, the effect of the blue is to make the orange very strong, and the effect of the orange is to make the blue very blue. But you can see that there are differences in the blue where some of the blue has white mixed into it, and some of it has a little bit of black mixed into it. So uh, as long as we understand that they are still all blue, the hue name is blue, we are beginning to learn right now that color can um, exhibit itself in different ways. Here's another example in Matisse's painting. The next to the woman's head on the right side, we see a green that's kind of a blue green. And on her nose, it's more of a yellow green and probably with a little black mixed into it. And the red also at the top of her head is more of a blue red. And down next to her shoulder and her chin, the red, which looks a little more orangey, has yellow mixed into it. So these are the way that we describe the hues by saying it's more of a yellow red or an orangey red or more of a blue red or a blue green. Here's a Kandinsky painting, again, that has different kinds of greens, yellow greens and blue greens. And on the rooftops, the houses, some of them are blue reds and some of them are orangey reds. And even the blues, we can describe that way. And, uh, and the yellows, green, yellow. So there are yellow greens and then there are green yellows. So they're mostly yellow, but they have a little bit of green, like on the lower right part of the painting. If a color is very warm, while we describe it, we can say the reason it's warm is because it has a little bit more red into it. So this is violet, and violet with a little more red and less blue can show itself to be warmer. It feels warm to us because of the red. So the one on the left is warmer, and the one on the right has less red, maybe more of an even amount of red and blue, and so it's cooler. And it's true for every hue. The yellow on the left is warmer because it has a little tiny bit of red in it. It's not quite orange, but it's still very warm. And the one on the right does not have that red mixed into it. So it's cooler yellow. And the same thing can happen with blue. The blue on the left has a little yellow mixed into it. It's turning towards a blue green or a green blue. And the one on the right does not have yellow in it. It has actually has a little bit of red mixed into it. So it isn't purple yet, but it has a little bit of red, so it's a warmer blue. Okay, so we talked about hue. Hue, again, to repeat, is color name, and it's all the color names that we know. Very simple. And now the second element that we're going to discuss about color is how light or dark a color is, and the word for that is value. And we can say a color has a high value or a low value, or it's very light or it's very dark. And here's an example of a range, a value range. And you can see that the lightest value possible is white and the lowest value possible is black. And with grays, the range in between white and black runs from very high value gray to very low value gray. So in my color range, I have about nine different values. And you can have a hundred, or you could have three or four. You can, if you were, if you were in an art class or a color theory class, one of your assignments would be to paint this range. And you could actually mix as many as you wanted, but it still goes no darker than black and no lighter than white. <clears throat> so one of the questions that we can ask when we look at different colors is which one is darker? If we're looking at two colors like this one, and we're looking at red and green. And one way to tell is by squinting your eyes when you look at this. So when you're doing that, you're allowing less light into your iris. So the cones, which in your iris perceive hue, are not able to work as well. And um, the rods are the ones, the parts of your iris that are really working and they see light and dark. So when you squint your eyes, you can get the feeling that the red is darker than the green. And another way we can check it out is by matching the red against different values of gray to see which one it matches. And in this case, we can see that the red is very similar to the dark gray. If we squint our eyes when we look at it, we look at the red next to the light gray, it seems to have a very sharp 
edge between the light gray and the red. But, and the middle one also has some somewhat of a sharp edge, but if we look at the dark gray, it seems to blend together a little bit better. If we do that with the green, we can see that the green tends to blend into the light gray a little bit better. We're always aware that it's green and it's not the same hue as the gray, but still there's a very sharp ridge right at the edge of the dark gray where it meets the green. So that teaches us that this green is lighter than, I'm going to go back a slide, lighter than that red. And here's an example of red and green where they are the same value. They're very high value. And that's a painting with mostly very high values and some that are a little bit lower, but they're still mid-range, not, not very dark at all. That's by Frankenthaler. And that's in fashion design, a lovely Dior outfit where all of the colors in there are the same value. And, and you can tell that they are because when you squint your eyes at this, they all seem to blend into each other. Even though the hues are different, there's blue and red and green. But you can tell that the value is all pretty much the same. On the left, we have low value. They are all pretty much the same low values. And on the right, they are high values. The green and the yellow are high values. And there's an example of a low value painting. And that white line in the center and the, on the left, there's a little bit of white in the painting also. It looks like it's part of my lovely slide with the red, yellow, and blue, but there's a little bit of white there that Clifford Steele actually put into the painting. So aside from those white stripes, the rest of the painting is very low value. And those are all different hues, but they're all mid value and they're all really the same value. So we can see in clothing how it looks. If you look at her boots, this is one of my favorite examples of it. On one side, she's got an orange boot. On the other leg, she has a pink boot. But squint your eyes and look at them, and they almost seem to be the same color. They're totally different hues, but they are the same value. And in clothing, we can play around with value by making a contrast in value. And I always like to say to my color theory students and my art students that contrast is your friend. It's one of the most important things to do in your design work. And in this case, Balmain has very low value black, which is of course the lowest value we can have. And he has also a navy blue shirt in there, which is not quite as low value as the coat, but still pretty low. And the pants, which are very high value. They are almost as high value as white with the floors, but not quite as high as the floor, but a very nice contrast against the coat. And we can see here value contrast in the painting. The lowest value is the sky or the mountains or whatever it is behind the houses. And the houses themselves have snow on it, so that's the highest value. And as you look through the painting, actually in the snow, we can see several values of gray and blue. And so I would say this painting, the story of this painting, what Kandinsky was trying to say is the contrast in value. And then we have this wonderful painting by Corot, which uh, I think it shows a, a really wonderful strategy in using value to help us see the center of the painting, to help us actually focus on all of the foods on the table and the two figures, the baby, and I guess the mother at the table. The background is very low value, very hard to see and to discern all the figures in it. And the table itself, the tablecloth is very high value. And then we see a contrast right in the middle with high and low value. And actually the eye is always drawn to the center anyway in any work of art. And so high and low, low value contrast in the center are also drawing our eye into all of the foods that they have on the table. So that's an example of one hue, but all different values of that one hue, which is blue. So now we've gotten through hue and we've gotten through value, which is how light or dark a color is. And now our third element of color is intensity. And my definition of that is how saturated versus how grayish a color is. 
so we can look at an example here. If we look at the red on in the model on the left, we can see her sweaters are uh, very intense red and her pants are not as strong. We could call her sweater uh, in unapproved, not color theory terms, fire engine red. But when we look down at her pants, also one approved words, burgundy, the approved words would be it's a, a low, it, a low value, dark blue red. It's a blue red. And if you look on the right, the blue in the sweater, the skirt has had white mixed into it with its tint, and also known as a high value blue. But the sweater, which is not pure blue, probably has some gray mixed into it. So it's not very intense blue either. It probably is um, what we call a tone of blue. So here, just like I had the value scale, here's an example of an intensity scale. If we take a very nice intense green on the left and a white, which has no intensity at all, and we mix little bits of white into the green, we get a little bit of a lower intense green. And if we mix a little bit of green into the white, we get a little bit of a more intense green than the white. That's what an intensity scale is. And here I do it with gray and violet. And you can see the range going from no intensity gray at all, no intensity at all, to very high intensity violet on the right. And we can also do it with black, high intensity yellow green on the right, and mixtures of a little bit black next to that, and then a little bit more black next to that. And we're beginning to get very beautiful greens in the middle, but their intensity is lower because black has been added. So a little bit of terminology, if you add white to a color like this lovely magenta, now the white has turned it into a tint. And if we add gray to the magenta, and here this gray is mostly gray and just a tiny bit of magenta, now we have a tone. And if we mix black, into the magenta, we have what we call a shade. So now I want to show you what it looks like to have a contrast in intensities. And I, I think with these paintings, I'm going to show you three paintings by Jacques Louis David. It's really obvious that he's thinking about intensity and utilizing it in his work. This painting of Napoleon has all low intensity colors in there except for one element, and that's his cape. And because of that, the cape is drawing our attention. It's the focal point. And it's a more, much more intense color than everything else in the picture. So it's what we look at. Of course, it's in the center of the picture, which draws our, our eye anyway, like visual perception dictates. That's how a visual perception is how our brain actually operates. And that kind of dictates to our eye look at the center of the picture. But it's red. It's very high intensity red, but he did this painting in different colors. So here you can see there is not one high intensity color in this picture. The yellow is slightly more intense than the background and it's in the center. So we look at it, but there's a vast difference between that painting that we just saw and this one. And there's a third one that he did. Just to go back a little, that one, you can see the red is very intense. This one, he has a red cloak and there's a little bit of blue that's more high intensity than anything else in the picture. But all of the colors in this picture are fairly low intensity. And then I always like to use Monet's haystacks to show what contrast and intensity can look like in a painting. In this case, you can see the bottom of the haystack the red one, especially the one on the right, is a much higher intensity than everything else in the picture. And he's, of course, painting his impression of the light and how the light looks at this particular time of day at the end of the summer. But he did his paintings during different times of the day. This is midday, and all the intensities are lower. So we can really get a sense of um, Nothing is very strong. Here again, you can see the sun is very strong on the haystacks, and here it's very soft. Everything is kind of washed out. 
And then in this third one, that that's much later on in the day, late in the day, and you feel the long shadows because of the very low intensity and the very actually mixture of red and green in this picture. So again, different intensities, although they are all red and green. They're all the same hues, but they're different intensities. And here's an intensity contrast if we look at clothing. On the right, very high intensity red skirt, and the top is no intensity at all. It's, it's actually black and white. It feels like it's gray, but it's stripes of black and white and a lot of black in the middle in her bag, and there's no intensity. And it's a very nice contrast against the skirt, and it makes us look at the skirt. And on the left, again, we have black on the bodice, which has no intensity at all. It really highlights the lovely, beautiful gray orange skirt, which is high intensity. More examples, red and black are classic combinations of no intensity black against high intensity red. And on the left, it's clear that these designers are thinking about intensity contrast as an element of design. So here we have very high intensity green and middle intensity blue and absolutely no intensity black as a contrast in this outfit. And then I went into interior design to see how that would look. And here's a room with, with no intensity gray walled and white sofa and the black top of the table. And the only elements that have high intensity are the yellow table and the pillows, the bars and the painting. And you can see that they really stand out as a contrast against the no intensity gray, black and white. So that leads us into a really important concept, one of the most important concepts in color theory, and it's called simultaneous contrast. And it means when you look at two colors at the same time, in the same, as we call it, visual space, they force each other to look as dissimilar as possible. So let's see what that looks like. So here's one of my favorite color theory tricks where we're going to look at the little purple square in the center and say which one is darker and which one is lighter. And one's on a red background, one's on a blue background. And of course, your answer, I hope your answer is going to be, oh, the one on the right is definitely darker. So actually, it's a trick because, of course, they're the same purple. But the background hue is what's making both of these little tiny squares look entirely different. That's an example of simultaneous contrast. The red on the right is sort of sucking the red out of the purple or violet to make it look as different from itself as possible. And so the result is it's a blue or violet. And on the right, that's what the blue is doing. It's sucking the blue out of violet so that what we see is a reddish kind of violet. And I want to show you red against its opposite, which we are going to describe a little bit more in a few minutes, but its opposite is green. And in terms of simultaneous contrast, the green wants to make the red as red as possible because it's different from green. And the red wants to make the green as different from itself as possible. So red and green together are very strong. And that little red square is very, very intense. And it's more intense even than placing it on gray. So it's a reason why some galleries will paint their walls a light gray like, like this one. And um, some galleries will actually paint their walls different colors, like the old fashioned way to have salons in, in France, we paint the, the walls a dark red, but you'd have to realize that simultaneous contrast says that red is gonna contrast against all the other colors in the painting and change the way they look. Uh, and another example is in the Barnes Museum in Philadelphia, um, Alfred Barnes stipulated in his will that all of the walls had to be a very low intensity yellow and all the paintings against them, no matter what color they have, are going to be viewed against that yellow. And it's gonna be quite a different feeling from looking at a white wall or a pale gray wall like like this gray square. So a little bit of graphic design. The one bottle that we really see 
is the green one because the field of red is opposite, complementary to the green. And I know the designers knew all about color theory and simultaneous contrast when they did this ad because they they want us to look at the green bottle. Coca-Cola historically has had a green bottle. And online we can see this. It's an orange background. And the shop now is the opposite of orange and it's very vivid. Orange and blue actually scintillate against each other. So that's another example of simultaneous contrast. And here's an example of simultaneous contrast in value. It does the same thing. A little red square is against a background on the right that's darker than the square and on the left that's lighter than the square. And so simultaneous contrast says that the light orange background is going to make the little square darker. And the dark red background is going to make that little square lighter. So of course, these little red squares are the same exact color, but they appear different. And so this is gonna be something for you to remember when if you're an interior designer, you're using your colors in a room. If you're a fashion designer, you're using colors together in your outfit. What colors you put next to each other viewed simultaneously are going to uh, describe how the viewer sees the colors that you're using. And here's an example of a classic contrast, black against white, black is the opposite of white, and it's consequently a very strong contrast, which you would know if you ever use black and white in your design work. So a little bit more, if we look at the light violet on the top, next to the very intense violet on the bottom, the light violet does not feel very beautiful, it doesn't look like a violet, it doesn't look like anything. It feels like it has no personality. But if we look at the violet on the right next to the gray, now we can see that it's a violet. It's very light. It's a tint because it has white mixed into it, but we can see what color it is. So if you're doing interior design and you want the story to be about the light, the very pale violet, you would not paint the rest of the room the intense violet because we'll never see the light violet at all. So used in interior design, because these the, the walls are very, very low intensity green and the black white photos are no intensity at all. Consequently, first of all, we see the red books popping out everywhere. And second of all, we see the very red, in, it, the sofa. It's not a very intense red, not like fire engine red, but the low intensity green wall makes it feel much more intense. And the same thing is happening here. Everything is low intensity except for the red. And that bench is even stronger than it would be if the background were any higher in intensity. And an example in painting, the reds in the cloud are the orangey reds in the cloud are not really screaming red, not very high intensity, but they feel very strong because they're against low intensity colors all around them in the sky and in the ground. And uh, here we have an example of a blue against the orangey chair. And the, the blue is, this is simultaneous contrast at its best. Um, Ang is making sure that the blue looks as blue as possible and the orangey chair is making that happen and the blue is making the orange look as orange as possible. Okay, so we got through hue and value and intensity, and now we're moving on to color relationships. And so the first thing we're gonna talk about is complement. So there we have purple and yellow, blue and orange, and red and green. And these are actually proportions of colors to use next to each other suggested by the philosopher Goethe. He actually has a couple books that he wrote about color. And he suggests that when you use the complements, violet and yellow, you have 70% violet and 30% yellow. And when you have the blue and orange together, you use 60-40, 60% blue, 40% orange. And with red and green, he felt 50-50 was gonna work better. So an example here in a painting by Joan Mitchell, 
it seems to me that she's got 60% blue and maybe 40% orange. And um, I don't know if this is really 50-50, but I do want to say that because the red pants feel so intense, the background feels greener than it would normally without the red pants. And here's an example. It's just natural of red and green, or maybe the, the artists who paint, the painters who painted the buildings, maybe they knew what they were doing. But look at all the different kinds of reds in the houses in this lovely Italian town against the green hills. They all just seem to be perfectly situated there because of the green hill. And here I have uh, in fashion design, a few examples of how to use violet next to yellow. Here we have the coat. It's a, it's a yellow, but it's a golden yellow. So very low intensity. And the violet is a tint in the skirt. Again, very low intensity. <clears throat> and the two highlight each other in contrast. Here's another example of violet pants with yellow on the top and different intensities of yellow. And here we have the blue skirt against the orange coat, a wonderful contrast because they're complements. And again, very low intensity blue, and it really strengthens the intensity of the orange coat. <clears throat> here it is in, in interior design. The orange wall makes the blue cabinet and uh, the green blue vases on the table and the blue behind the dog. It makes it feel so much more intense and vice versa. And here we have the blue and the orange and they're actually against white, a lot of white, which has no intensity at all. <clears throat> but the blue against the orange, the blue and the, 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 the orange actually is very high intensity and it looks really great against backgrounds that have no intensity at all. It makes that orange sofa really stand out. And I love looking at record covers, especially um, psychedelic record covers from the 60s and 70s because it was really artwork. So this one from Cream is classic red and green. A lot of red here. I think more a higher proportion of red than Goethe suggested, but um, still the red highlights the green and it makes the green really stand out. Here's another concert poster, red and green. I think the idea in psychedelic posters was not to be able to read it. That was a little different from the ideas right now. So you have to work very hard. It was like a, maybe a drug experience. And another example of opposites working together we're just really we're not able to not look at that sun because it's very red against a fairly green background it's kind of a blue green but because of the simultaneous contrast of the red sun against the green we really see it so the story is the red sun and there's just a very little bit of red sun in there that's all you need to make that the whole story of the painting and here, I think this red and green is actually 50-50. And consequently, we don't really have one focal point because it's 50-50. Uh, I also like to look at Monet's cathedrals. He also painted them different times of the day. So here, there's a higher percentage of blue than the orange at, in the morning. And we can look at that next to this one. We can see that the light is getting stronger. And it's probably more percentage, a higher percentage of orange than blue. And here it's probably much more blue than orange. So you can see that Monet is thinking about pr proportion of orange and blue and different intensities. And a lot of artists think about that. This Gerhard Richter, he's using blue and orange and possibly 60-40. Um, the blue, though, is mostly tints with a little bit of that shade of blue, meaning in, at the very top, there's some black mixed into it. This is Gerhard Richter with red and green, probably 50-50. And uh, okay, so now we're gonna talk about some other color relationships besides complements. That's split complementary, where we use different kinds of violets opposite the yellow, and in this case, orange and blue. So we have different kinds of blues opposite, different kinds of oranges opposite the blue. And it just gives us a nice range with all the different kinds of oranges. 
but because they are still basically complementary to the blue, they really enhance the blue. So here we have orange and blue, they're complements just to repeat, and we have um, the complementary relationship, orange and blue. And another relationship we can talk about is the triad, red, yellow, and blue. And that's how it might be in one living room. So in this case, we see the books. They're actually, maybe some designers don't like designing the bookshelf based on color, but that's what this one is. It's red, yellow, and blue books. And then that's another living room where now the colors have moved into the furniture. So we see red and blue in the sofa and a little bit of yellow that, that are really highlights on, in the flowers and the cushion on that chair. They really stand out. And here's Vermeer's painting. Everything is red, yellow, and blue. And the, the strong part of the strong essence of the relationship is that the red and yellow and blue are so very different from each other that everything really stands out. And this is a contemporary painting with red, yellow, and blue. And, and there's a little bit of orange in there. So another relationship that I like to talk about is analogous hues. And in this case, analogous means, in, well, in every case, analogous means that these colors share something in common. So violet is made up of red and blue. And if we look at the colors on the right, we see mostly blues and a little bit more of the red in the one on the bottom. And that same violet that has a little more red in it is in another family as well on the left. It's in a family of colors that have red in it. So they feel, because they share the red, they feel like they're in family. And if we look at Van Gogh's painting, we can see the green and the blue that are analogous next to each other. Frankenthaler was thinking about it. There's blue and green in that one. There's another one, blue and green. And there's a little tiny bit of orange in there that complement to the blue that stands out as small as it is, it's complementary to the blue, so it really stands out. And if we wanna look, look at clothing, we can see that this is analogous because it's yellow and orange and red, and it all feels like it's uh, part of a family. <clears throat> That's how it is in a dress. A couple more outfits. Those are analogous, the blue and the violet. And this is how it might be in an interior design, a lot of purple and purple is analogous with blue. And that's how it can look if it's on a sofa that's absolutely no hue, it's just white, or in this case, it's a little bit of a silver color. And the blue analogous hues, the blue and the purple, and um, some of the purples are a little redder, they all share blue, they're in just the cushions. This is how a room would look with the analogous hues, yellow and orange. And also going in the other direction, the yellow is analogous with the green. <clears throat> and that's another room. There are many ways to design your room so that you're using analogous hues. Um, you can think about the proportion of each color and where it's placed, how much space each color takes up and where it's actually placed, as well as the three elements of color that we talked about, how intense those colors are, exactly what hue we're talking about, and how light or dark they are. So in this picture, if you squint your eyes and look at this, you can get a sense that they are really all the same value. Nothing is really very light or very dark. In this case, we have, we have analogous hues blue and green, and they're right next to each other. And then the ceiling is a kind of blue-green. And the background is different kinds of white. So the blues and the greens really stand out from each other. But they also pull together as a family, if you really stare at that picture long enough. <clears throat> In this picture, we can see both relationships, the complementary hues of orange and blue. And in the trees, we see the analogous hues of orange and red. And then down in the grass, we see yellow and green, which are analogous. And that's the color of my textbook. 
And it's a, a wonderful painting, which I did not do. Um, and a lot of blues and orange. And um, blues and orange are very strong because they're complementary. So it makes us feel like this is actually a place. So at this point, I've gotten through all the slides. And I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Marcy. And yes, for those watching, I know we have a few seconds delay in the live stream. So to give people time to formulate the questions they may have and put them into the chat, I certainly have a few questions of my own. So thank you for that. Great. Uh, one of them is about actually thinking about the show that we have coming up at Fairfield. I know Suzanne Shamlin has used a particular kind of color theory, the Munsell system, which adds this other dimension of chroma. And I just wonder if you could talk very briefly about that and what that adds to the discussion that you've just presented. Sure. Um, there were a lot of a lot of color theorists uh, back in the 1800s, Munsell, and late 1800s, early 1900s, and Munsell is one of them. Um, what he has is a color matching system. That's actually a system that preceded Pantone. Pantone is what we use now. Um, so he's not only talking about color relationships and color theory, but he he was actually working with how to describe color. And um, he actually listed different combinations of primaries that you put together with red, black, and white to make different colors. And he has a three-dimensional system. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, he, he was trying to figure out how to describe color visually so that we can see it all in one visual element. And it includes hue and value and intensity. And he used the word chroma. It's, it's kind of old fashioned. For him, it was a mixture of value and intensity. And it's not really used the same way today. We've kind of simplified it today. And we just use the three elements of hue, value, and intensity. But he was, this is this was his theory. And he was describing color with his three-dimensional model, which um, is kind of a sphere. And from top to bottom, it has light to dark. And inherent within, it's got all of his values and intensities and cues. So um, kind of complex. And again, not really utilized as much today because we've moved on to other ways of describing color like handsome. And I have to ask you, do you do you frustrate all of those around you with your insistence on using the very specific <laughs> language of color theory to describe something people want to call ox blood or something like that? Yes. And I'll tell you the, the worst thing for my students is I insist that they use tone and shade the right way. Because a lot of people in general will say, well, I really want to use a different shade of blue on the wall. And I go, really? Did you mix it with black? Is that what it is? And my students go, uh, well, no, because they, they want to use it the way you do out, as I say, on the street. But I insist that they don't, that they use tone to mean you mix gray with a color and shade to mean you mix black with a color. So, yes, I drive them crazy. <laughs> well, your students at least have signed up for it, but... <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mar Margaret, that abuse. Uh, one of our viewers, Margaret, said not a question, but she just wanted to appreciate the orange and blue contrast in your setting. So did you think about your setting when you uh, prepared for today's talk? My background? Yeah. Uh, no, this is just where my computer is. <laughs> so just just absolutely by chance. Yes, it, it just really is. Yeah, and that's a, another that's a painting I did back there on that doorway. Oh, is it really? Yeah, and you were mentioning before we joined the talk that you have done uh, painting on pretty much every surface, ceilings, floors, walls, uh, the barriers protecting stores before they open. I sure have. Um, yeah, I've worked for um, retail stores, for hospitals, movie theaters, uh, Memorial Sloan Ketting, the, Kettering, the ceiling uh, on the 19th floor, the cancer floor has my clouds on it. Yeah, I've done a lot of commercial work like that. Another one of our watchers, Femka, says, fascinating lecture. Who was the writer of books on color that you mentioned when you were first talking about complementary color? Was that Goethe? Goethe, Goethe. yeah, G-O-E-T-H-E. -E. He's a philosopher. He was a philosopher. And he wrote, uh, you can read them. I, I actually stood in a library once and put the books down and just stood there for a couple hours reading them because I, I am one to do that sort of crazy thing. And I don't find them very useful for color 
um, for knowledge because mostly he's describing everything that he sees around him. He would go for walks in the woods and see the birds and the trees and just try to describe everything. But he, he didn't quite have a handle on um, color theory as we're learning it now in modern days. But it's, it's fun to hear what he has to say because of course he's wonderful. I, I, when you mentioned his name, I was not expecting to hear Goethe as the author of a book on, on color theory, I but I wonder how, how the added challenge then of, you know, it's in translation from his more old fashioned German then into English for us to read that for a translator that must run into all sorts of new issues of describing color. I would think it would. I obviously read it in English, so I don't even know what, what trauma the, the writer went into. <laughs> And that actually leads me into a, another question, which is how how universal is color theory? Are there culturally specific uh, elements where you mentioned that you have students that are are absolutely global at Parsons? So mm -hmm. do you have a sense? Are there some like culturally conditioned aspects of color? Uh, yes and no. So first I shook my head and said no, because color theory itself is more objective. And there's just one way, there's, just, there's one theory that we're working with. Now, everything that I told you is what color theory is, but the yes part is the subjective element of what colors you like and how you feel personally around color. So that's not really what color theory is. Um, there's an, well, there's an element of color which dictates the effect that color can generally have on people. Uh, so it's not personal to any, any, anyone, you or me. It's more that uh, the idea that red is a very passionate, strong and exciting color and orange is a very energetic color and blue is a color. This, this I could go on forever and I'll try not to bore you, but blue is a color that is more uh, reliable and constant. And so, for example, you will see logos for banks in blue because they know we can rely on them to use our money wisely as opposed to red, which would be uh, very passionate, like, oh my God, what are you doing with, with my money? But the element, the essence of color theory is not subjective, it's objective. Got it. And we have another compliment from Julia who says, thank you. In today's lecture, I finally, she put finally in all caps, succeeded in memorizing the distinctions among tint, tone, and shade, because you said <laughs> high versus low value. And suddenly I could see tint being high value, tone being mid, and shade being low. Yes, that's exactly right. So I guess after you've been doing this for many years, you have you have mastered the way to communicate this effectively to your students, which is fantastic. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from uh, Robert, who is asking, "How do I relate red, gle red, green, blue, cyan, yellow, magenta, and red, blue, yellow systems for describing colors?" Okay, so he's talking about um, light-based primaries in color and pigment-based primaries in color. So the cyan, the magenta, and the, the yellow, and black, for some reason, CMYK, those are your printing inks. And they have been changed from red, yellow, and blue because in the printing industry, it's more convenient for printing inks to have those colors. Not necessarily any reason that makes sense in color theory. It's, for some reason, it's a technical reason. Um, the red, yellow, and blue are primaries for for paints, when we're actually painting our pictures or my walls that I was painting. And for a light-based system, the primaries are different. So for lights, for your computer screen, for a movie, uh, this is all light-based systems. Then the primaries are red, green, and blue. They're not, and, and the mixture together, the secondaries are also very different. So um, they're just different systems. And I can get into a whole explanation of it, but I'm just going to confuse everybody. <laughs> no, well, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Ellen who asks, has Faber-Mirren influenced you at all? Uh, yes, very lovely books. Um, he's a color theorist. I, I read his books. Um, I read all the color theorist books. And I, um, I maybe a little bit of an influence, but I have to say that Itten is the most influential for me. I-T-T-E-N. Um, the maybe the most clearly described books on color theory, a little bit more than Faber Marin. Also, the the books are not they were printed a long time ago, and they weren't uh, at that time able to print the colors as clear as they really should be. Um, 
And the same thing goes with a lot of color theorists. But I guess they must have reprinted the in books more recently. So then red is truly red, blue is truly blue. So, so that was a long-winded version of my answer. I loved how you mixed, you you went between a more traditional, older paintings, contemporary art, and also fashion. Do you recommend your fashion students, for example, to make sure they visit all of New York's wonderful museums to sort of take in the <laughs> colors? Um, we do talk about it a lot. You know, the Metropolitan Museum has a lot of fashion exhibits, and I wish we lived in London so we could go to the Victorian Albert, the best fashion collections ever anywhere. Um, yeah, I do. I talk about museums all the time. Uh, and I saw that we did have someone watching from London, so they are someone oh, probably oh, presumable oh, access <laughs> yeah, to the DNA. Uh, Julia has, and we have just a few minutes remaining, so if you do have some questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, we'll try to get to them before we, we have to get, go away. Uh, Julia asks, taking a class using paint, how do I know whether to use magenta versus fuchsia or ultramarine versus cobalt as starting points for my mixes for my hue circle and my tones and tints and shades? Okay. So you're using paint, so you want a true red, a true yellow, and a true blue. <clears throat> so cobalt is um, probably a, is a little bit yellow. It has a little yellow in it, so it's kind of a green blue. Um, you might want to use an ultramarine blue. But really, if you if you when you buy the paint, it'll just say blue hue, red hue, yellow hue, and then you could pretty much say those are the primary. So don't don't buy. A fuchsia is not a, a, an approved color name. And um, you're not using printing inks, so you don't have to use magenta and yellow is the same thing, and cyan, those are printing inks. Um, if you take red, yellow, and blue, true hue, red hue, yellow hue, and blue hue with paint, and you want to make magenta out of the red, then um, you just have to add a little blue to it. You can come up with you can come up with all of these colors, and that's it's just what they did with the printing inks. But it's not what you have to do with your paints. You just need the true hues. Great. Okay. I hope that answered the question. Well, if it doesn't, then Julia has a couple minutes to to ask a follow up. But we have from Ellen. Do you think value difference or complementary color difference will draw the eye more? How can I choose? Like choosing which? What's your favorite baby when you have? children. That's um, okay. So you're talking about visual strength. We're getting into um, deeply in the weeds here, but um, value differences, if we're talking about black and white, is a very strong contrast. It's real. It's, it can't be, you, you can't be a different value contrast that's stronger. Um, but complementary hues, you know, our eye sees it differently if we're looking at orange and blue better than red and green, better than yellow and purple, and orange and blue scintillate, they're, they're also very strong, but it's in a different way. And the eye sees it, the cones allow us to see the colors and the rods allow us to see the value. So, you know, you can't really say one is stronger than the other, but they're both very, very strong. We had a question from Pamela that I can answer because she said, is there a color theory book you would recommend? And I can say, well, there's the one on screen. There, there it is. We, yes. we already said Goethe might not be the one you want to go for. And you mentioned another um, writer who had influenced you and you spelled it. Do you want to say that one again? Yeah, it's an I-T-T-E-N. Yeah, right. very, very nice books. Always printed very nicely. Again, because it's probably done more in a more contemporary fashion. Um, but my, my textbook is color theory plus composition plus little visual um, um, not visual merchandising, a, li a little um, visual perception. I blanked out on that word. And also, um, I do write about inspiration for design and how to utilize inspiration and turn it into design. So it's it's a, a um, huge textbook on a lot of subjects. Well, I'm going to use as the last question one from Margaret that says, are there any absolute no-nos in combining specific hues, values, and intensity? So tell us what not to do. Um, it really depends on what experience you want to give to your viewers. And so you have to know what your goals are. If you want your viewers to be excited, contrast is your friend. If you want to bore them, don't use any contrast. So what okay. not to do depends on your goals. Great. 
And we had one final question from someone asking how to find your textbook. I assume it's available on Amazon. Amazon. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. You'll find it on Amazon. It's about a um, hundred and something dollars. Well, thank you so much to everyone who contributed their questions. And thank you to this evening's speaker, Marcy Cooperman. And thank you for giving us some more inspiration to go out and notice all of those color relationships. Yes, I hope you all do that. My pleasure. I always love talking about color. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody.